Hi everyone, my name is Corey Williams and I'm with the Fayetteville Public Library and today we're going to be talking to Lee Wheel, the author of Hunting the Unabomber. Uh, I'll go ahead and just introduce Lise to you all. She's a New York Times bestselling author of both fiction and nonfiction, a journalist, an attorney, and a legal expert. She's a formal legal analyst for Fox News and the O'Reilly Factor and has appeared regularly, regularly on Your World with Neil Cavuto, Lou Dobbs Tonight, and the Emus Morning Show. Um, she's a former co-host of WOR Radio's WOR Tonight, and she has served as a legal analyst and reporter for NBC News and NPR's All Things Considered. She served as a federal prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office and has tenured um, or was once a tenured professor of law at the University of Washington. And then you might also recognize her from CNN as a legal analyst. So thank you, Lise. We're so excited you're here. I'm so grateful to be here. It's wonderful to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Yeah, I guess the first thing that kind of just comes to mind is why this case, why the Unabomber, what kind of drew you to write about this? Well, as we were talking about just a moment ago, I am drawn to cases that I think have huge social relevance, way beyond whatever crime the person committed. And when I was looking at studying the Unabomber, I saw here's a guy who committed these crimes over the course of about 18 years. I mean, this was the longest hunt that the FBI to date has ever investigated. So right there, you've got something that, wow, that's an historically relevant fact. You know, what kind of, what happened during that 18 year long hunt? And as a daughter of an FBI agent and having grown up in that, in that world and as a third, uh, third generation federal prosecutor, my dad was a federal prosecutor after becoming an FBI agent. My grandfather was a federal prosecutor. and I was a federal prosecutor. I had worked with many FBI agents, been around them, been around federal prosecutors who handled a Ted, like a Ted Kaczynski case. And so I knew the world and I just wondered what was that 18 year hunt and case like? It must've been like no other. And then the social relevance to even now this manifesto that was published, one of the main reasons they got Ted Kaczynski. Uh, what kind of relevance did that manifesto have then? And even now this compute, hate, complete hatred of computerization, of technology, of how that was going to tear down society. You know, people still read portions of the manifesto. They're still followers of that. There are still organizations out there and, and, and you know, random sort of um, groups that still believe in some of that uh, manifesto, if not all of it. And then there was another piece too that had to go back to the FBI. The FBI changed their methodology of catching the bad guys. Basically, you know, they didn't say this, I'm saying this, because of the blunders and mistakes that they made in the course of those 18 years of following him, Ted Kaczynski. I didn't know that part of it when I started down this road of studying. I, I figured that out as, as I went along, but there were just so many things um, that attracted me to the subject matter. Also, the person himself, Here's this brilliant, I mean, Einstein-esque by the IQ of him, goes to Harvard at the age of 16. And, you know, math wonderkin teaches in a California school, you know, and then drops out, and then drops out of society completely, goes to this cabin, lone cabin in Montana, outside of Lincoln, Montana, and then makes these bombs, you know, crude bombs that then become better and better, who is this person? Seemingly no motive, couldn't find a motive, and you know, you, yet is devastating to an entire country for that long a period. I found that person, that personality intriguing and I wanted to know more about what drove him and who he was. So all of those things put together made for a very interesting case study. The hard part was to find a new angle into the case. Yeah, exactly. And that, and before we started, I kind of mentioned this, but I feel like the level of terror that America kind of felt, you know, about him, 
kind of went through generations because I mentioned this before we started that my mother used to tell me, don't pick up packages that you don't know where they came from on the porch or, you know, watch out for certain mail. And then, you know, and then soon after that, um, after they caught him, there was also the anthrax scares. But, um, but yeah, that level of terror is, is just amazing. You know, it's, it's really interesting. Well, that's right. And I was living in San Francisco at one point where he was, you know, in San Francisco was really one of the, one of the main crux of the places that he was doing the bombings. And that's right. You were told, you know, don't open any packages that look on weird. I mean, and sometimes the packages didn't even look all that weird. But anyway, don't open them. Um, you know, be careful of anything that comes in the mail. And we're talking about the U.S. postal mail. I mean, good old U.S. postal mail. And by the way, there were post, U.S. postal workers or post office agency was involved in the investigation. It wasn't just the FBI. I mean, there was a multi-task force, multi-jurisdictional, not just federal. It was state. You had even locals, um, psychologists involved, you know, they're policing involved because it was so multi-jurisdictional, which caused actually a lot of problems, but that's another part of the, part of the book. But um, yeah, I mean, he really terrorized the whole country to a point where they, you know, the FBI put out, you know, 1-800 numbers for any tips. You know, has anybody seen anything? That's because, and that was really unusual for the FBI because the FBI doesn't usually like to do that, right? They want to be able to solve the case themselves. We don't, frankly, need the, need the, you know, the, the country or the citizenry to help us. And at one point I painted a scene in the book where one of the big guys at the FBI says, I don't care. We need to put this tip line out because we need to ask people. And they don't like to do that, not just because they're macho, but also because it kind of scares people to think, you know, what, it's up to us to find the leads for the FBI. But everybody was on the lookout from guy with a mustache, you know, and in a parka, because that's that, you know, iconic uh, um, sketch that I think is burned pretty much in our heads if we lived through that time of the first sketch of the Unabomber when he was seen dropping a package and a woman saw him and drew up the sketch. And that's what he looked like. He's in a hoodie, he's got a mustache. And that sketch was put out everywhere. And did anyone see anyone like him? Well, I mean, who hasn't, right? <laughs> so there were many, many, many leads, of course, for the FBI to follow. And none of them led anywhere. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you to speak on how the authorities really couldn't find him. It was, I think you just said, an 18-year search. Um, why do you think, like, with all of the resources and everything that the organizations had, you know, why were they still not making any headway? So many reasons, in part because Kaczynski was brilliant. I mean, crazy, <laughs> but brilliant. I mean, he went to this cabin in Montana with, I believe, the sole intent to perfect his bombing technology. It was rudimentary to begin with. I mean, even the plane that he tried to blow up, because he did try to blow up a, a plane, hence Unabomber for universities and airplanes, uh, for airplanes. But it didn't go off. I mean, it went off, but it didn't really do much damage because it didn't go off kaboom in the way that it would bring down a whole airplane. It just went off a little kaboom. Um, it, that was because the, the, it didn't detonate properly. So he went about perfecting his, his bombs better. But the reason it took him so long is because he was getting his bombs and making his bombs through just junk that he could find and or near the kind of the junkyards around Lincoln. And he, so we didn't go to, you know, regular, just uh, let me, you know, go buy a bomb kind of places where, you know, the FBI could then go track the, uh, the stores. But I'm talking about just basic hardware stores, battery supply stores, where you could, you could track down where the purchases were made by serial numbers. Anything that he used that had a serial number, that was wiped down clean. 
any equipment that he used. Again, it was mostly from junkyards, but it was wiped down clean as well. So part of the job for the FBI in, in Quantico is to send it to the lab there, where the lab then does, it's not just, it's not just FBI manpower, it's Quantico lab resources. And they kept coming back, you know, sorry guys, we got nothing. It's like there's no fingerprint on the bomb. So if you have a crime scene again and again and again with no fingerprints, you know, obviously there's not the fingerprint of the guy. And by, and by the way, they didn't know the, whether it was a guy, a gal, a group. You know, for a while he was calling it FC and we. So they didn't know if it was a major, you know, terrorist bombing uh, organization. They had no idea. But when the lab results kept coming back, we have nothing, we have nothing, we have nothing. We can't pinpoint it to Dallas or California or New York, anywhere. We can't pinpoint it to a state to even be looking at for this stuff. That made it near impossible to try to track him down. And again, living off the grid, nobody noticed him. He was this quiet guy. He, you know, stayed there in Lincoln. He did his business. He didn't work. Um, barely saw anybody. He was kind of a hermit. So he himself wasn't out there making any noise or doing anything or causing any attention. Right. Well, and he was so very smart. That was really yeah. one of my favorite parts of your book was when you talked about his childhood and, um, you know, his life growing up. And then I kind of wanted to see what you thought maybe was his tipping point because reading it, I felt like he was kind of a great example of what social development and well, how important social development is for children and teenagers. And for me personally, that's what I felt like kind of, I guess, stunted him in a way. But I, I kind of wanted to see what maybe you thought was, when was the moment he decided I'm gonna go live in the woods, you know? And Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit murky. Uh, let's go back a little bit to his childhood. I mean, he had a brother, um, David, who turned out just, you know, fine, normal, seems like a, a great guy. I actually even got a letter from him um, during the course of writing the book. I wrote to him, I mean, I wrote to both, both Kaczynski's. Ted never wrote back, surprise. Uh, but, you know, I did ask for an interview. But I wrote to David as well, his brother, his younger brother, who all growing up through childhood, I would say adored his older brother, thought his older brother just walked on water, was so bright, uh, you know, could just do anything. And, you know, just, just adored him. And I think they had a good relationship. I wrote to, I wrote to David about the, for the book and asked him if he would speak to me. Now, here I am, I have no connections to him, anything like that. And he wrote me, he wrote me back, wrote to me a nice letter, not a too, you know, sorry, you know, go away lady, but a really nice letter. It was a no letter. It was, I'm not, the end result was no, but it was such a nice rejection. <laughs> you know, it went on for lines about, you know, he's spoken, he, but he's, he said what he had to say. And though he really appreciates what I'm doing, you know, he just doesn't think that, you know, he just doesn't have him in him anymore to talk anymore. But it was just, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It was just kind. He didn't have to do that. Right. And I just appreciated that. It just showed me again what a, what a kind sort of feeling sort of person the brother is. And I also got a sense from his growing up that the mother and father loved Kaczynski, Ted, very much. There was some um, internal battle in the family between the parents about whether or not to send him off to Harvard at such a young age, because that was very young. He obviously was very bright. He was a protege. I think the parents were very proud that here they had under their, their roof, such a bright young protege. He got 
got to go to Harvard. How could they not send him to Harvard at age 16? I mean, here he was, you know, the, the, he's got to go. But there were some qualms about sending him. And I think the, and they were told by a couple of family friends, you know, we think this is too early. Don't, don't do it. They were told, but send him, they did. And I think Harvard made some mistakes, most notably when they got there, they put all the 16 year olds, all the ones that were that young, and they, they did this for, a, Harvard did this for the right reasons, but I think it turned out badly. They, they sequestered them. They put them in their own dorm so that they could all be together. Thinking, I guess, that, you know, they shouldn't be with the 17, 18 year old coming in because it, 16 is just too young. But in my mind, you know, hey, they accepted them as freshmen. They were gonna have to mingle with the slightly older ones anyway. Why make them feel already sort of ostracized, if you will, even more, you know? So here's Kaczynski comes in. He's not from, you know, a fancy Ivy League prep school or any of that. So he's already kind of feeling that a little bit insecurity, maybe. Um, and then again, he's put in with these, these young men, young, and not have the chance to kind of meet other kids. And then he gets put into this wild experiment that would never be allowed in any university, I believe, today, testing his metal, his psychological metal. It, and that was just all wrong, I think. Now, would he have still turned out to do what he did? Probably. But those things that I just mentioned, those cataloged, that I cataloged, certainly didn't help. Um, Harvard's tough at any age. And I just think to go in at 16, not be from, you know, not have this kind of the confidence, the swagger that you would have for being a little older, having gone to a prep school, all that, you know, it can be tough. It can be tough. And then going into that, that crazy experiment that he went into that should not have been allowed, wrong. And what's interesting, just to kind of prove that he had a hang up about Harvard, he never bombed Harvard. Bombed Yale, he bombed California schools, but somehow he just did a little run around Harvard. Didn't do that. You'd think he'd bomb his alma mater, right? My take on that is, is he didn't want to bomb Harvard because to do that would to show that Harvard got to him, really did get him down, really did bother him, that they really had, you know, brought his metal down and, and, and got into his psyche and he wouldn't want to show that. So we didn't bomb them. I mean, kind of a reverse sort of psychology weird thing, you know, and they gave me my psychology degree with my JD. So, you know, that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> so you can test my theory anytime. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think another thing that's so interesting about this case is all the different pre precedents that it set. It was kind of astounding. Um, would you, if you could speak on a few of those, what those precedents were? Well, you mean the precedents for the FBI, the, yeah. the things that they did? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the FBI before had never, first of all, they never had computerization the way they have now. I mean, they had to bring in, it's kind of ironic. Here's a case where the, the, the target, they didn't know at the time it was Ted, Ted Kaczynski. The target, his whole deal, his whole rail is against computerization and modern, modernization, modernization and socialization is just gonna be ruined by computers. And the way they were going about to get him was bringing in this mammoth computer into a jurisdictional effort, multi-jurisdictional effort by the FBI, by Postal, by all these different organizations that were gonna get him. Now the computer didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. And there were meltdowns with it and things being put into it that didn't work and things being spewed out and things that wouldn't happen. And, and my main source, uh, Webster, uh, Webster uh, 
uh, Patrick Webster, um, you know, was just befuddled, uh, bemused, um, you know, angry, all of these different words um, by what happened. But hundreds of thousands of man hours were put into building a computer that could take in the data points of all the information, all the, all of the um, tips that were coming in and it could be used to try to track someone down as elusive as the Unabomber or whoever the Unabomber could, was. And, you know, some say that the manifesto was really what caught him. And I think, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. But talking with agents afterwards, and you're saying, but for the manifesto, would you have caught him? And they've all told me, yes, but slower. But we would have because we had, we finally had the computerization to do it. So ironically, uh, he would have been caught through computerization. And that was a huge precedential set, both by the fact that you had multi-jurisdictions working together, multi-agencies working together, and this overhaul of computerization in the FBI that now, of course, has taken over and has changed the FBI. But that was the Unabomber that did that. So it was the Unabomber that changed the computerization of the FBI. Yeah. Ironically. Ironically. Dated technology, yeah. 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 I, was, I was thinking about it as I was reading and thinking about his hatred for technology because he thought it would ruin humanity. Yeah. And I thought, okay, here we are, fast forward, what, 20 something years later. Um, Talking on Zoom. Talking on Zoom, yeah. I, mean, I think a lot of people would maybe, to some degree, maybe agree with that in a way. To say, you know, you see a lot of articles about how social media is ruining our socialization skills and that it's bringing us farther apart and all of these things. And I don't know, I, I thought about that as I was reading it, where I guess there is a speckle of truth to some of his manifesto, I don't know, but I, I thought it was interesting. I think, I think even at the time, um, and this was before we got so much into social media. Remember, this was, you know, this was now a while ago. But even before the prevalence that we have now of people, you know, not being able to go to a restaurant and eat, eat a meal without, you, you know, you looking over and every, the person next door at the next table, well, when we have tables again on their phones and you know not able to detach even before that i think agents were saying in the you know that we're hunting you bomber and we're reading the manifesto were saying privately to themselves and said to me later you know, off the record you know off the record but enough so that i could tell you <laughs> um those kind of conversations. We didn't necessarily disagree with some of the things he was saying, just like you and I are talking about. Mm -hmm. But the methods, the way he was trying to get his message out by bombing people, the methods and the, and the message, no, never the twain shall meet. I mean, if you have a message you want to get out, get a message out, start a group, get an organization, have protests. But this kind of message, and then to use the manifesto, which is what he did, the manifesto got out. Because do you want to jump, jump to the manifesto and talk about that? Or should we, I'll wait for your question. Oh, no, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay, because that kind of brings me to the, to the manifesto. The manifesto that we all know about, you know, the Unabomber's manifesto, that got published because the, the Unabomber, and again, again, we didn't know who's Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber said to the New York Times and Washington Post, 
I want you to publish this manifesto. If you publish this manifesto in one of your papers, and it's got to be one of your papers, it's not going to, it not, it can't be, you know, Playboy or something like that because they offer. And he said, no, no, thank you. <laughs> it's got to be something much more reputable than that. It's got to be the Washington Post or the New York Times, you know, specifically. He said, then I will stop the bombing. Now he says, I might do a little sabotage, but I'll stop the bombing. And uh, so there was, I, I, there's a, a, a scene here in the book where I take you inside of that meeting. So you've got, you got the head of the directors of the FBI meeting with, and, and, and top profilers and agents and people who are involved, meeting with the publishers of both papers. That's a pretty intense meeting because as you can imagine, the reaction from the public publishers is no we're not going to publish this why because we same same as governments don't you know negotiate with terrorists we don't negotiate with terrorists and that's negotiating with terrorists by the way this manifesto was not some you know three paragraph thing that you could hide on the third page this was supposed to be published on the first page and was going to run quite a number of pages. It's long, if you've ever read it, it's a long treatise. And secondly, even if we publish this thing, he says he's gonna stop bombing, but he's a terrorist, he's killed people. How can we believe him that he'll stop this? We don't know, we're negotiating with the terrorist. <laughs> we don't know his motive yet. He's given us no motive. We're chasing a guy with no motive. He's given us no ransom. We have no idea why he's doing this. So we can't figure, since we haven't been able to figure out why, we don't know whether this, this publication, will stop him from doing it. No motive, no reason to figure out you know, whether this will be, will be the why. So there was a heated conversation and it was mostly, let's not do it until one profiler said, who I follow in the book here, said she agreed with all of that, but she said, look, let's face the facts. We, the FBI, have been following this case for all these years, and we are stuck. Stuck. We got nothing. We don't, you know, we just can't find this guy. And if we publish this manifesto, will he stop? Probably not. You're right. But maybe somebody, when they read the manifesto, will see something in that manifesto that will remind them of somebody they know. And they'll report that. And that will give us a lead that we need. It's better than we got now. That wasn't a lot of, like... Like, okay, we're going to get him, but you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a guarantee, but it was enough. And they agreed to publish the, publish the manifesto. And so there's some kind of interesting scenes, right, as, the, as it's published, um, FBI scrambling around that day. And it's sort of funny now that it's over to see the mishaps that happened on the day because did, they didn't find him that day. Other people were picked up and wasn't them and I say it's sort of funny now it wasn't funny at the time I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> and at the but time was a break. yeah and then just at the time a few years before they were talking about just closing the investigation altogether oh you hit on a sweet spot for me <laughs> when I get really angry about mm -hmm. so when I started this book, I knew that it was the longest hunt in, in you know, FBI history. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. There must've been a lot of ifs and rifts and a lot of internal battling and everything, but they finally got the guy. And this is like one of the biggest accomplishments for the FBI. You go on the FBI website and hunting the Unabomber, it doesn't say hunting the Unabomber, it says Ted Kaczynski. I, 
I say hunting you. You know, it's a big deal. They got it. But what I didn't know is exactly what you said. There was a point um, in during the hunt where, and this I got because I got a source who early on when I started the case, um, I found an agent who'd been retired for a long time and he had just had an idyllic retirement and uh, on the East Coast farmland. And I got a hold of him, sort of using my federal family key, saying, I've been, you know, I was federal agent, daughter of the FBI agent, will you talk to me? And once you say daughter of a federal uh, FBI agent, they won't hang up the phone. Because, okay. you know, that's be really rude. If you say journalist, click. But daughter of an FBI agent, they'll at least listen to you. It'd be rude because he might know some of my dad's cohorts, which they actually did. Turned out they did. So I got Patrick Webb to talk to me about it. And he said, you know, I have to tell you, something is really sticking with me about what's been written about the Unabomber. There was a, a mini series done the summer before. And they got a lot of stuff wrong. I mean, really wrong. And if the American public look at that mini series and they think that that is what the truth is about what happened with the hunt for the Unabomber, they'll be wrong. Now, Webb should know. Webb was in charge of the Unabom task force for years in San Francisco. Remember I told you California was sort of the pinnacle of the Unabom where it was bombing. That's where the FBI put the uh, Unabom task force. So Webb was in charge of it. He knew all the ins and outs. Webb was there when, uh, they, took a, when they took Kaczynski out of the cabin. Webb was there when they put, pulled the typewriter out of the cab. Webb is a technician bomb. Webb was there at many of the crime scenes. I mean, the man knows. The man knows, okay? He knows of what he speaks. So I said, let's discuss this a little further. Let's discuss this a little further. And we did, 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 and we did. And I learned so many things from him. I mean, the, the documentary tried to wrap it up into all one neat little bow, saying it was one FBI agent that fixed the whole thing, that became good friends with the Unabomber. Turns out the FBI agent had never even met the Unabomber. Um, it, it just was a bunch of little things like that. But even more importantly than that, in the course of one of our discussions, Webb said, did you know that the FBI was at one point going to close down the investigation? And I said, no. He said, yes, uh, it was going to be closed down because they thought that the, the Unabomber just couldn't be found. He was either dead or in another prison, but you run out of leads and they were just going to close it down. And that just absolutely astounded me that frankly, the FBI would have so little vision to see that. Of course he would come back. This guy, he just went into hiding. This is what Webb believed so strongly. Other agents in the Bureau felt strongly. And so I've got a couple of scenes in here where I talk about what he did to make sure that the agency kept going and that they got it all the way up to headquarters and kept this whole thing running. But it was hard, it was really hard. It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> he was very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I know you had a passage that you maybe wanted to read from your book. You want, well, we kind of just touched on, on what we were just talking on about motive. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't mind, I might just read you that. Um, we it, can read that and then we can um, answer some questions from the audience. Okay. I'll just read it because it'll give you a little bit more context as I was telling you about there being no motive and about the FBI just about to shut down the investigation. This is uh, in 1992, um, and the FBI, things had sort of lost you know, momentum. There had been no attacks for six years. It's easy to understand 
why agents were having an extraordinarily, diff extraordinarily difficult time with the Unibom case. More often than not, investigators can determine some kind of motive for criminal activity. But in this case, the suspect had never given law enforcement any idea of what, motive, of what was motivating him or what his ultimate goal might be. There was no apparent rhyme or reason to the bombings. There was no clear connection between the airlines, university cap campuses, and the small no-name computer shop. To make things even more difficult, they were dealing with someone who was very astute at covering his trail. The Unabomber took great pains to ensure that the investigators couldn't track his various bomb components back to him. I've seen many, I've seen many white collar criminal cases or fraud cases that have gone on for years with very few leads and paper trails that often lead to dead ends. But this was a criminal case and still nothing existed to give investigators traction. Follow the money is the mantra for many, invest for many investigations. But in the Unibomb case, there was no money to follow. There was no effort at extortion, no manifesto, this is the pre-manifesto, that would help to find motive. The investigators were trying to track down a ghost and thousands of pages of documents proved of little or no value. The lack of clear motive was the most perplexing question. Why was he sending these bombs? The fact that the case was multi-jurisdictional was presumed. That's why it became a federal case after all. But the lack of a consistent target or theme behind the targets was an enormous frustration. Investigators can't analyze or look for clues in a vacuum. They have to analyze them against the backdrop of a potential motive to think of why a person or persons would act the way they do in order to predict why they will act in a certain way in the future. In the bank robbery cases I prosecuted, I would look at a bank robber and see what he had done, his pattern and behavior over time. And more than once, I've been able to anticipate and catch him at his next job. In those instances, the motive was obvious, money. I just had to analyze pattern and behavior. With the Unabomber, there was seemingly no way to analyze pattern or behavior to ascertain motive, and no motive emerged no matter how long and how hard the investigators analyzed the case. With the Unabombers, investigators were dealing with someone who was very intelligent, but the usual motives, money, revenge, sex, did not seem to apply. So what was it then that had him targeting professors and grad students and researchers and computer store owners owners and airline executives. And more importantly, why had he suddenly stopped? This brought the FBI to the pivotal point where, because the lack of any real progress in the case, some at headquarters questioned whether the Bureau should continue to support the investigation. There was speculation that the Unabomber might never resurface, either because he was no longer alive or because he had been arrested and was incarcerated for some other crime. In early December, Webb, that's my source, received the call from headquarters directing him to stage what would prove to be the pivotal, pivotal, pivotal Unibom conference in San Francisco, where Webb and the others worked the case, would, uh, would learn that headquarters intended to close down the investigation. It had been nearly six years since the drawing of the suspect had been released to the public. And despite countless tips and innumerable man hours from investigators, the team still had no solid leads and was no closer to arresting someone than they had been six years earlier. It was there at the Holiday Inn at Union Square that Bob Pochica from the Criminal Investigation Division revealed the Bureau's waning interest in pursuing the Yonabama. It is anyone's guess how things would have shaken out if Agents Webb and Conway hadn't taken it upon themselves to convince Lab Chief Chris Wanray to fight to keep the task force running for another year. Great. Yeah. Um, let's see. We'll take a few questions from okay. people. Um, Happy to. I'd love to get questions. <laughs> we had someone asking that without um, Ted Kaczynski's brother David calling the FBI <laughs> and saying that the manifesto sounded like him, would he? have ever been caught? Well, as I said, some of the FBI agents who sort of spoke to me on the side said, we were tracking somebody who fit Kaczynski's profile, mm -hmm. who had taught at Berkeley, uh, who had that IQ. 
and we were we were getting closer to him, but it probably would have been another, he, he ventured another six months. Now, I don't know whether that was just lucky guessing or whether he was real about that guessing. But they all said, yes, we would have gotten to him because the computers were up and running, but they were feeding data, data you know, pieces in all the time. Things were spewing out and narrowing and narrowing and narrowing down. And that his name was going to pretty soon be on that list. Oh, there was also, there were books, mentioned this. There were books that he was, uh, there was one thing he was making himself on the grid. Because since he was going into the local library there, uh, at Lincoln, oh, those libraries, I'll get you every time. <laughs> and checking out some rather obscure books mm -hmm. for which the librarian there, because it was a small library, would have to order, you know, do an interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. Those would, were being picked up. So they were going to we be good being cross-checking those uh, and we're, we're getting closer to pin, pin, pinpointing him to Lincoln. So actually the library books were going to help with the search. So not far off, maybe six months would have been realistic. But of course, with the uh, sister-in-law of Kaczynski in Paris, recognizing some of the words and verbiage that Kaczynski used in the manifesto, telling Ted about them and convincing Ted to go talk to somebody, a lawyer actually, and contacting the FBI 1-800 number, that changed everything. Somebody also wanted to know kind of about your process. Um, how long does it take you to write the nonfiction books? I'm sure longer than the fiction, but on, on what kind of a grand scale is it, you know, two to three years versus one or? Uh, it is, you know, it's, it is such a process um, because the thinking about it, you know, when you're not actually writing anything, just sort of, it might be three months, I'm giving rounding out, three months just deciding on the subject. Like I'll have a list of 10 different, top, you know, 10 different, that could be, you know, Ted Bundy, you know, I, I don't, I have no interest in doing Ted Bundy, but I just throw that out there and Unabomber. And then, then I'll study, do little mini studies of all of the people I might be interested in. Um, and not knowing what kind of source I'm getting, like getting, you know, Agent Webb for Unabomber opened up just a wonderful box because that he led me to other sources, right. who led me to other sources. So it just like that was that was it. That was that was, whew, there I went. Uh, but I didn't know that once I chose the book. Chose the book. So say three months to just choose, mm -hmm. and then really get into it. Then it's the research, and it's the, then it's research, and that by that I mean not writing, just writing research. I right. mean you're on the phone, you're trying to get interviews, you're trying to push people through the interviews, you're going to interviews. In the case now for the book I'm writing now, it's I'm doing all paper calls, you know, as or Zoom right. call and do it that way. Um, and so that that takes months, 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 months before I even write anything. Right. And just in my head, now where would that interview go? Where would that piece go? What what story can I tell here? Because I want to tell a story. I mean, even though it's nonfiction, I want my fiction, I want it to almost read as mm -hmm. fiction, even though you're reading nonfiction, in the sense that it should be, it should be short chapters, fast, fast paced, interesting, mm -hmm. and uh, keep, keep it moving, keep it moving, keep you interested, keep it, keep it alive for you, alive, alive work. That's what I'm trying to do. So two or th two two years at least, and then there's the process. And when it's released, then talking about it and marketing and just being having these conversations. And that hopefully that never ends. <laughs> hopefully we're always talking about it. Is there um, the being able to write nonfiction as if it could be fiction? I mean, being able to tell a good story is that part of your criteria for choosing? A certain subjects, you know, Charles Manson, the Unabomber. How do you decide? Well, 
I suppose any of them, you can tell a good story, right? I mean, they're, they're all stories. Uh, so I don't really worry about whether I'm gonna be able to tell a story, they're all stories. So it's a story when I get into it. Mm -hmm. You know, Patrick Webb told me stories, the right. in internal stories. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of my, then that's just a matter of craft and telling a story. You know, how you put it together. Mm -hmm. uh, with Manson, there was a lot of gore and guts and stuff. Right. And other people have done that. I think I had one small chapter on the actual murders mm -hmm. out of what, 330 pages? Mm -hmm. One chapter. And the rest was all investigation. Why did the women do this? What was the investigation like? What were the prosecutorial tactics? You know, all of that. Because I figured you don't need, you know what, you know what the murder scene looks like. We need to let's move on. So that was it. Um, let other people focus on that because if that's what they that's what they're wanting to do. Um, I personally wanted to know: Do you think his lack of socialization from teenage years onward? contributed to his more violent tendencies or do you think that would have happened anyway? Do you think he could have ever been socialized? You know, he made some efforts. He tried quote unquote dating a couple of times uh, before he went out to Lincoln mm -hmm. and it did not go well. Mm -hmm. Now, if it had gone well, who knows? But he really eschewed anything, right? He he pushed away his brother, really, pushed away his mother, mm -hmm. other than to get money from her to build a cabin. And once that was done, really didn't ask her for anything except more money for bus money to um, drop, off, yeah, drop off the bomb. Um he was a horrible teacher by all accounts because he didn't care about teaching. He just wanted to do his research. Right. You know, so I think that was just kind of built in. I mean, you have two brothers by the same parents. So presumably they were socialized fairly similarly. Now he was, he was known as a wonderkin and all bright and everything. So maybe he was treated a little differently. I'll give you that. But still, he was under the same roof. Mm -hmm. And one brother had enough strength of moral character because it was not hard. I mean, it was hard for him. It was not easy for him to turn in his brother. Mm -hmm. And he sat there, by the way. His mother and his brother sat there, by the way, um, when Kaczynski pled guilty. Mm -hmm. And you... You know, they were in pain about this. Kaczynski never turned around, never, never mm -hmm. even acknowledged it. So it took a lot for them to do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those seem like people with high moral standards. Right. And, and highly socialized. Because I mean by that, they're socialized and they know, you know, they have sensitivity to other people. Mm -hmm. They, you know, feel like other people's pain. And... Because it's clearly did not. Right. Um, Corey and I were talking earlier about his manifesto and some of his dire predictions kind of coming true, sort of his overall vision of technology taking over, and that has kind of happened in many senses. Um, did attitudes about him change once people realized he was right about some things? I mean, I know we were also wondering why is he in a supermax? And I know Charles Manson oh. was really, they were afraid not that somebody would kill Manson, but that Manson would influence others. And I, I know there's not that risk with Kaczynski because he did never talk to anyone, but um, we were wondering why he was in a supermax. Well, Kaczynski is a killer. I mean, don't forget, people die. Yeah. People die because of those bombs. I mean, he's lucky that he, he got just prison without possibility of parole. I mean, mm -hmm. people were, were 
you know, kill. Mm -hmm. So he's a murderer. I mean, he's a domestic terrorist murderer. So I don't have any sympathy for him. Mm -hmm. This is my federal prosecutor, hard nose line for me out, but I have no sympathy for him being in, mm -hmm. in hard mouth. Um, I don't know. And he can write to people. I think he does. He didn't write to me mm -hmm. because he knew what I was doing. But I think he writes to people that that I think he thinks would be more, um, you know, understanding of what he wants mm -hmm. to say and maybe get his message out. I think he is still probably doing that. And, and that he has the right to do that because Penn mm -hmm. and Penn, I think in Supermax, they allow him that. But I have no problem with him being supermaxed. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a killer. He yeah. wants to kill more. He, he listen, and he wrote in his he wrote in his diaries that were found, and, and Patrick Webb found them in this little cabin in Lincoln, in his diaries. He wanted to kill more people. Right. He was disappointed when the bombs didn't go off as mm -hmm. as well as he wanted them to, and didn't kill as many people as he mm -hmm. wanted them to kill. He was perfecting his grasp so he could kill more people. There was a live bomb found mm -hmm. in that cabinet in Lincoln. Oh I mean, goodness. he was ready to go and keep going, yeah. and keep going and keep going and doing this if they hadn't found him. So, message or no, right. the way, the means, the mentality of delivering that message was to lethal bombs that kill people. That's a domestic terrorist. And by the way, we should have a law in this country that, that that's not mine. Mine's turned off. It's not me. Um, phone was turned off. I can't imagine how I'm getting phone calls. Sorry about that. Um, we should have a law in this country that makes domestic terrorism a crime mm -hmm. because we don't. You know, that's what's so incredible is that we, um, uh, when they arrested him, when they arrested Kaczynski, mm -hmm. they, they, they pulled him out of the cabin and they brought him down to kind of a staging area. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of fuddling around because they had enough to arrest him right. and bring him down to hold him, but they didn't know what to charge him with. Right. So they were looking around for any more, you know, any more evidence you find them. and then they found their then they found the typewriter and that they, they had written everything on then they found the live bomb and okay game's yeah. over we have enough to arrest them on the killings and the bombings it's good we got we got them for murder but my thing is if you have a law for domestic terrorism you give local and multi-jurisdictional mm -hmm. uh, law enforcement so much more power. And I really think at this day and age, this is, you know, all these years after Ted Kaczynski, we don't as a country have a law for domestic terrorists. We really should. I know New York is considering it. I think other states should consider it as well. I think it should be a federal law actually. And that yeah. it would enable state, federal, and local jurisdictions to work better and share more information. Because that was another problem that I really saw, is that the agencies, because they had to be multi-jurisdictional agencies, they weren't very good at sharing information. Mm -hmm. Now that's just part because that's kind of like, they don't like to. Right. <laughs> they like to keep information to themselves. Mm -hmm. But you know, something this big, they have to. They need to, to protect us. And that would be one way, one small little thing legislati legislatively that could be done. It's not that big a deal. Just make it a federal, make a federal anti-domestic terrorism law. Mm -hmm. Domestic terrorism. Right. Um, we've got one more question from yes. people in the group. Yes. And I'm wondering about his state of mind and his family not being attuned to his state of mind. I mean, it, it would manifest as mental illness, I would think. I don't know if it's your family, you tend to kind of not register it, but um, his sister-in-law seemed to be the only one, at least in the media, the only one that was like, Ab absolutely, I knew, you know, he was crazy. And, but the rest of the family kind of seemed like they were in denial. 
that could well be the sister-in-law who actually said, you know, saw the manifesto and said, you know, I, I think this is, this certainly sounds like him. Right. He'd actually never met him. I don't know if you knew that. She never actually never met him. Why? Because Kaczynski hated her, but she never mm -hmm. met him. Why did she, why did Kaczynski hate her? Because she was marrying his brother. And to him, to Kaczynski, getting married at all was just like the biggest betrayal that his brother could ever give to him. It was just like, that's, you're getting married, that's betraying our, our pact of brotherhood, you know, mm -hmm. we're never gonna leave each other, we're always gonna be there for each other. So he didn't even come to their wedding because he didn't. Right. He would buy all things about her. So she didn't have any pers person, you know, personal knowledge of Kaczynski. Mm -hmm. She just said, I've read the letters that Ted's written about me to you. And yeah. just some of the verbiage, some of the way he uses language is very similar. The words, the way that, intonations just the way he uses phrases in this in this manifesto you take a look at it and tell me if i'm wrong mm -hmm. and so david took a look at it took a look at it and said i can't tell you i can't tell you it's him i can't tell it's unabomber right. but i can't tell you that you're wrong either mm -hmm. maybe we should get some you know somebody to look at this and that's how it started how long did it take between uh the brother notifying uh, actually pretty, catching him. Or, pretty oh, fast. Uh, brother notified him. They went to a lawyer and got some help. They called the hotline. Not that easy to get to because so many people were calling through. Right. Um, but once it got to the right people to, to Webb and his guys, that little sock pocket of people I was telling you about, mm -hmm. they recognized that this could be it. This could be it. They then got linguistics and got really into looking at the manifesto and going through with David. Once they realized, yeah, we, this is a very viable subject, they honed on Lincoln, they honed in on where he was. Now yeah. that's the tough part. Mm -hmm. They didn't have, I told you a second ago, they didn't have any physical evidence, right? right. So how do you convince a judge mm -hmm. to give you a warrant to pop into, I can't just go to your house and pull you out of your house. Mm -hmm. I have to have a warrant to do that, but I need to get into your house and pull you out of your house. So it's a catch 22. So I can see that there's that, uh, there's a live phone, there's a typewriter where you wrote all those notes. Right. The at was, I have your scene in the book there where that was just this cringe, you know, tight walking thing where they've got all the agents on the ready, which mm -hmm. took a lot to do to make sure that nobody heard them or saw them that was very tight in Lincoln. And certainly because he didn't get freaked out and leave, mm -hmm. waiting while they're near, nearby, they're trying to get the search warrant based on linguistics, you know, who he was, all the other things they fed into the computer. Mm -hmm. and, oh. and the judge, gave them the warrant for the getting him out. Mm -hmm. And then they got him and they said, then they got enough. But the, once they got in, that cab just gave them everything they needed. Including his diaries and- Yeah. Uh, and that elusive typewriter. Yeah. The Corona typewriter. That was a big part of it, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And Webb was there. Webb was one, you know, taking out the typewriter, my source. So he was an amazing source. I, I dedicated the book to him because he um, unfortunately passed of cancer before the book came out. So mm -hmm. But I'm very grateful to him. Do we have any more questions? I think that might be it. I have one last question. Yeah. So. You have your series, you have Hunting Charles Manson, and now you have Hunting the Unabomber. Are there going to be any more hunting books in your future? I am already hunting away. <laughs> okay. <here> today. <laughs> Take a break from my other hunting to come back to this. 
course. I never stop. No. Yes, I am already on to my next hunting. The third of the hunt, the three book series. And I'm on to the next one. And uh, once again, I, I use the same parameter in choosing my subject of relevant, continued relevance, social interest, um, you know, in, interesting, kind of weird. Who is this person? Like, I've never really, never heard too much about. And, but wow. And then once again, it's shocking to me. I get into this mix and there's like, how did I find this person? And then I find this person and that happened. Well, that's never been discovered, but then that leads me to another thing. So once again, I'm just in this like, just falling down the rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. lovely rabbit hole. There you go. <laughs> I pulled myself out to come to the library <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> It's lovely to get out of the rabbit hole once in a while. Thank you for lifting me out. We're excited for your next book. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm excited you are, and I hope you like this one. It was, it was a delight sometimes to do. Sometimes it's just hard work, but it was always a delight to do because I, I felt like I felt like we were writing the true history of what really happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was important to the agent I was working with, my source, and it became important to me too, because, you know, these, these important cases have to be told the right way. It's right. Just, it's just history, you know, we want to get it right. Mm -hmm. And this is, and you mentioned the precedent that's set for the FBI. It's still there now. I mean, mm -hmm. we can learn from this stuff, you know, we can all learn from how this is done how law enforcement works, you know, good or bad. There are a lot of mistakes they've made in there, a lot, a lot. Right. And I, I tell them that it is, I say this. Um, but that's how we learn. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was a kind of a fun read, fun of read. Yeah. Can you give us a hint to what your next book will be? Corey and I are gonna start now? guessing if we won't stop. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, very very relevant to today, though it happened in the in the past. But it's increasingly relevant to today. Um, that's about it. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. I'll talk about it at work tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. We'll brainstorm until maybe next spring, and then it'll come out. Like, oh, we knew. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Everyone's thanking you in the chat. And I just right. appreciate you and your time. And it was a great book. Everyone should, needs to read it. I really enjoyed it. So thank so you. So glad. And I'm so, thank you so much for having me here. And I'm so glad that your library is, is back and the people are coming in and that you're there and that, you know, you're, that we're all kind of, we're doing the best, right, as we can in whatever the the new normal, whatever we're going to call it. But, but you know, it's it's so ironic as we touched on this that here Kaczynski was so against social, you know, computers, and they would desocialize us. And right. yet here I get to talk to all of you guys mm -hmm. and see your lovely faces. And the only way we could do, I mean, we're on different parts of the country and all that, different time zones, and we're doing that because of. The, the capability of the computer and mm -hmm. yeah, that's amazing to me it's bringing us together yeah. and that makes me happy you know I that's think, a great thing i think so during this time i think having the ability to do this has been kind of a saving grace if anything right so absolutely and people do it you know for this i mean i've been on my, with my mom and dad and my parents i mean my kids you know nephews parents and brothers I mean the whole families it's just, it's just to see their faces you know it's been marvelous so you know I just I I I Kaczynski you know that part of it I'm just not I'm just not taking these days <laughs> a lot of part of it I'm not taking these days <laughs> Thank you, please. Have a good rest of your evening and thank, thank you for joining you. us. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much.
to the listeners out there and the, and the great questions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And you can always go to my um, Facebook or leasewheelbooks.com. That's my, that's my website, leasewheelbooks.com. If you've got any questions, I have a newsletter there. And uh, you can ask me any, any time. Happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you.